Um, so in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to give a short presentation. I'm not so a short presentation about our ESMED experience, and then I have a short movie, or like a cut and paste movie about uh, some stuff that happened as well. Um, so ESMED is short for the Antarctic search, search for meteorites, and I participated in the 2010-2011 campaign. So first of all, I'll give you a little bit of a scientific background. Uh, what is a meteorite? A meteorite is a natural object originating from outer space uh, that uh, survives impact. Uh, it survives impact through the atmosphere and it survives impact uh, on the surface of Earth or any other planet, basically. Uh, the reason why I'm saying natural objects, um, you probably have followed the news in the last uh, week or ten days with this American satellite and also another European satellite, and the, especially the American satellite was. Uh, heavily uh, covered in the news because there were uh, uh, models being made that it could actually drop on, uh, on the city of San Diego. Uh, it ended up falling in the Pacific after all, um, but we don't call that a meteorite. Uh, we just call that space debris. Um, there are three different categories of uh, meteorites. There are stony meteorites. Uh, they are mainly composed of uh, rocky materials. There are iron meteorites, they're mainly composed of um, uh, metallic material, and then there are stony irons, which are obviously a mixture of the two. Um, there's two different categories in stony meteorites. They're the chondrites. Uh, they have undergone uh, just a little change after the formation of the solar system. Um, they contain chondrules, that's where the name comes from, that's like little round inclusions, grains which are formed by droplets of uh, molten material, it's what you can see uh, here, for example. And they pre represent the oldest uh, solid material in the solar system. Uh, the other category are achondrites. Um, the A basically means that they are not chondrite. And these are remnants of uh, bodies in the solar system that have undergone more uh, differentiation, such as planets or some asteroids. And they do not contain any chondrules. And here you can see two examples. For example, the ALH8401, which is a Martian meteorite, and then we have a lunar uh, meteorite on the right side. So, how did the ESMED start? Um, actually, in 1912, the first meteorite was found on Antarctica by uh, the uh, um, Mawson's Australian uh, expedition. Um, and that's still, I mean, Meteorites are found regularly, so yeah, that you find one on Antarctica, that's pretty obvious because you find them everywhere in the world. Um, so then in the 1960s, there were more meteorites found. Um, and still the same, it, it wasn't really that extraordinary yet. And then the Japanese went with a campaign in 1969, and they found on a stretch of three kilometers, which is a relatively small stretch uh, to find uh, meteorites, they found nine. Uh, meteorites close to the Yama, uh, Yamato Mountains. And this is actually a picture of the paper that appeared in two years later in 1971, which has a photograph of all the meteorites they found. What is the uh, scale? Yeah, the oh, the top. Uh, yeah, on the top. This yeah. is three centimeters. So this is about six, wow. and these are tiny, about centimeters. So um, and then after they analyzed these, uh, these meteorites, uh, they concluded that there were of at least five distinct types. So then uh, Antarctica became a little more interesting. So there must be more meteorites. And then the Japanese set up an experience in 74, and in 1976, ESMED started. So why would you go to Antarctica to look for meteorites? Actually, um, the polar influx, so the amount of meteorites that are falling uh, on the North Pole or the South Pole, is actually 5 to 10% less than what you see on the rest of the Earth, so it would not be the most logical place. But Antarctica does have a couple of advantages for searching for meteorites. First of all, they are extremely easy to spot on the ice. I mean, the ice is white and the meteorite is black. Um, they are preserved in the ice for a really long time, uh, for 10,000 to 100,000 of years. And um, uh, because of ice, it's, it's a very dry environment in Antarctica, although there is ice, it's all in solid, water is all in solid form, and for the rest you don't have much water there. Uh, it's extremely cold, and you don't have any environmental contamination. So if you want to 
to study meteorites that are relatively pristine, then Antarctica is the place to go and look for them. Um, and meteorites are concentrated in the ice and ablated through uh, through wind erosion, which you can see on this slide. So the meteorites fall, as you can see on the left, and then they get buried in snow, and the snow compacts and forms and, and, and starts growing big ice layer. And then the ice actually moves around on Antarctica. But when the ice uh, reaches a mountain, for example, the the ice gets ablated away, and the meteorites get collected at the base of the mountain, and they're worked up. And uh, at, at some point they get exposed. So the meteorites that we find in Antarctica are um, were fell somewhere between 10 and, and 100,000 years ago. So they didn't, didn't find fall yesterday. I don't think actually they have any reason to find some Antarctica meteorites. So as I said, the Antarctic search for meteorites, that's what Ant oh, is about. And in 76 was the first Ant led by Bill Cassidy. This is a picture of one of the first uh, ESMAD expeditions. And since 89, it's uh, led by uh, Ralph Harvey, who was also the PI in our, uh, our group. And uh, he leads uh, the field expedition, and here he's demonstrating um, how our actual search is going in the field, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a bit. Um, so far, about 20,000 meteorites have been collected which is 40% of the known meteorites. So as you can see, going to Antarctica is pretty successful. So where do we go in Antarctica? Well, this is all the places that ESMED has been uh, gone uh, in the past 35 years. And I don't expect you to read this, but then you get an overview. And most of the uh, search sites are uh, located close to the transatlantic motor range, uh, transatlantic. Um, so are there some uh, scientific highlights? Of course there are. Um, the first lunar meteorite was found, which was the ALH 81005. Um, then we had another, the EETA, Elephant Hills, was um, the first proof of a Martian meteorite. Um, measuring the gases that were uh, included in this meteorite, they could also um, uh, classify the SNC meteorites, which is the uh, Chassini, Nakla, and Shirkoti. Uh, those are three meteorite classifications that were thought to be Martian, but this meteorite actually defined that those meteorites are all Martian meteorites. Um, they had looked for organics in this meteorite, and then we come to the next meteorite, ALH 84001. Um, this was a big hit. This was the meteorite that caused a lot of stir in 1996, when researchers published um, that they might have uh, found uh, fossils, um, which appeared uh, not to be uh, for bi biological fossils, but just some uh, mineralogical uh, outline which looked like a worm. Um, so they obviously didn't find Martian life in this meteorite. They were also looking for organics in this meteorite, but the organics that they found in 98 were all uh, terrestrial contamination, unfortunately. And then two other meteorites in which uh, condensates from solar uh, nebula were found. So how does ESMED work? <coughs> this year, um, normally at least one team goes, and last year when we went there were actually two teams. Uh, one reconnaissance team, that's a sh smaller team that goes out to, to uh, uh, look at new sites uh, if, they're, uh, if they're good sites for a follow-up uh, bigger mission. And then there's a systematic team, and I was part of the systematic team, and the systematic team just has a patch of ice, which is systematically searched, and we try to um, collect as many meteorites as we can from that side. So if you look at this map, uh, this last year's reconnaissance team went to these two sites, and we went somewhere around here. And our year in total collected 1,250 meteorites. Uh, so this was the reconnaissance team from last year, they were at four, and they started, they flew to the South Pole, and then from the South Pole they flew first to uh, La Paz, and then they uh, they did a lot of traversing with ski down there just to make sure that they covered a large area and get get some idea about the inventory of uh, meteorites there, and then they flew to the second side of the Paxson range, and then they flew back. Um, they had a lot of bad weather and uh, uh, snow and bad visibility, so they had actually they were stuck in the fence for quite a bit, unfortunately. And 
they ended up going to two sites where there were not so many meteorites. Their team collected about 300 of the 1250 meteorites we collected. Um, so I'm not really sure if there will be ever a reconnaissance team going back to, uh, to these two sites. Uh, on the other hand, of course, these guys went to the South Pole and we did as well. We will be eternally jealous <laughs> for them going to the South Pole. Uh, so these are two area pictures of the La Paz range and the Patuxent range. And then this uh, is uh, the systematic team. We were eight. The guy in the yellow is the PR, Ralph Harvey. Um, he flies back a little bit before Christmas because he's been doing this since 89 and his family is getting a little bit tired of him never being home for Christmas and New Year's. So around Christmas he flies home to make sure that he has at least one of his holidays with his family and then he, he uh, someone else is taking his place. Um, so I'm the person on his right with the little patch of blue. And this is the area where we went, which is called the Dominion Range. It's close to the Dominion Range and it's uh, Mount uh, Ward Davis Limited, which is somewhere around here. So how does it go if you go to um, Antarctica. You don't just pack your suitcase and you leave. Um, there's a whole, um, especially all the uh, US operated uh, tours to Antarctica, all, all are operated through NSF. So there's a whole checklist and a whole protocol that you have to go through. So first you fly to Christchurch. And um, well, as you can see, we flew there in November. This was a picture actually that I took after we came back. So this picture was taken 10 days before the second earthquake. So that, that nice church is not there anymore. Um, and so first what you do is you pick up your extreme gold weather gear and uh, ECW because everything of course has to go with acronyms. Um, so you make a selection, you man there's a bunch of mandatory things here. These boots called bunny boots are mandatory. A big down jacket all the way on the right is mandatory, uh, all the way on the left. And um, well of course you can either borrow their uh, layers or you bring your own but uh, a bunch of this stuff is mandatory to take out on the field. And you all have to wear it in the plane, which is extremely uncomfortable. Um, so then you fly to McMurdo, and since I'm a little bit of airplane geek because of earlier habits, um, we got to fly the C-17, and uh, that's pretty cool, especially if you also get to move from the cockpit. And well, anyway, so this is a C-17, a huge plane, and um, this is what you're supposed to be wearing when you're in the plane or at least have close to you. So you're in a plane in a big down pants with your down jacket and your big plastic boots and then you have your goggles somewhere, you have a hat and of course in the plane it's 25 degrees. Um, so you're, you're flying and the C-17 has four uh, teeny tiny little windows um, so the situation in the plane is a continuous line in front of the windows to make sure that everybody gets a good look of when we finally reach Antarctica. So this was my first look of Antarctica, the sea ice around it. And, uh, if you, even though I had been to the Arctic before seeing this in the Antarctica, it was a pretty cool sight. So this is what you see when you get to McMurdo. This is McMurdo from the airfield. Um, there are two airfields close to McMurdo. One is open in the first half of the season. And that's the, what you can see over there. That's the airfield there. Uh, in the second half of the season, which is uh, close to uh, February, uh, the ice starts melting and they have to make a uh, way for the big uh, cargo ship that uh, replenishes all uh, uh, everything in, in McMurdo. So the airfield is then moved to somewhere behind all the way on the left of the picture. This is really nice, this is a 15 minute drive, the other airfield is about an hour or an hour and a half drive over the ice. So you actually land on the ice here, just to get an idea, there's a couple, actually we don't know. Couple meters ice, 15, 20 meters, I don't know. So you land on the ice, and then you take a bus and you drive to McMurdo. And um, well, I was lucky enough to be into uh, to the Arctic before, so my picture of Arctic is the Olesund, which is a really cute Norwegian town with nice wooden buildings and all colors of the rainbow. Looks extremely friendly, and then you get here, and this looks a little bit like a mining town. So my first impression of of, of McMurdo was a bit like. Mm. Okay, I hope I'm just going to stay here short and then we go out and go into the field. But fortunately, even around McMurdo, we have a bunch of very cool sites. Uh, these two pictures are actually taken after we came back out of the field. So as you can see, the ice is now open. It's, it's open for the, for the big cargo ship. 
on the left hand top you can see something that's called pressure ridges. So what happens there is because the thick ice layers, they still are moving around. And um, um, so they start moving on top of each other and form, I would say it's a little bit like plate tectonics and this would be a little bit like, I don't know, Himalaya or something. Um, and they actually organize tours and uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, it's a really cool site. Uh, this, the height of this feature is about three meters. So you really get like big walls of, of ice being pushed up. Another interesting thing if you're there is uh, the Discovery Hut, which was built by Scott in 1902 and he lived there during his uh, Discovery uh, uh, expedition. And this picture is a bit too dark, but what you see here on the table is actually still uh, penguins that he uh, hunted uh, when he was there. So those penguins have been lying there over 100 years. And that's still a part of uh, his uh, storage. And um, there's actually, there's a warning in there too, because there's anthrax. Uh, they've measured anthrax in there, which is part of the decaying seals that are also in the hut. So you do have to be careful. It's natural anthrax. It smells a bit funny too if you come in. But still, I mean, it's pretty cool to, uh, to be able to, to visit this. So then in McMurdo, he spent about uh, 10 days uh, preparing McMurdo. Uh, one of the things we had to do was uh, learn how to operate and fix our skidoos because most of our search was done on skidoos. Um, so we had to to, uh, to figure out how some part, how we had to clean it. For example, every night when we come back, we had to make sure all the snow was gone. We had to cover the skidoos up, and we had to uh, perform a couple check checks to make sure that everything was still working. And another thing we had to do was crevasse training. And the weekend we were supposed to be, normally they send you out uh, for a long weekend uh, camping outside just to train you. And then you have actually crevasse training in a crevasse. Uh, but uh, the weekend that we were supposed to be going, the weather was so bad and uh, that they decided to do the crevasse training just hanging off the ceiling uh, to make sure that we actually could go out in the field. So this is me trying to save myself on the rope. Um, and the other thing you do is you stock up on food because you bring all your food with you. Uh, of course, a nice thing about being in the field is the average temperature is uh, between minus 15 and minus 30, so you can bring everything, you just leave everything outside, so all the food, you bring frozen meat and frozen vegetables, and you can just leave it outside of the tent and it stays there. Um, one of the interesting things here is um, um, the most recent date I think we saw on our food was food that was about a year and a half over time. Most of the food was about two or three years uh, due, over the due date. Three years is their cutoff. So everything that's older than three years they throw away, but they really try to give you uh, as much um, uh, old stuff as they can. And then there was actually another really funny thing, because Dalo was kind enough to send me a package, and he even managed to send me sweets that were out of date. So <laughs> it doesn't even happen in Antarctica, also from Norway, you get out of the foods. So this is Rhiannon, the girl that I sent my dad with. And uh, so what you do is first prepare a list, which takes you a couple, a couple hours, so you really have to think for 45 days, what am I going to eat every morning, every afternoon, every dinner? You prepare a whole list of things that you think you need, and then you go in here, you have an hour to go through all the aisles, uh, collect your stuff, and pack it in boxes. And so there's more packing to do, because of course you have also to bring all your cooking gear, and um, so here we're collecting our cooking gear, which goes in the little brown boxes, which then in the tent uh, surface uh, shelving units. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time there, also because we had some weather delays, so they, uh, we couldn't go out in, uh, in the field. So after two weeks, we finally, finally, finally flew out to the field site. And uh, we did that with another cool plane, this on skis. And I got to sit in the cockpit, so I was all happy. <laughs> and um, so this is a little bit what you see. And this year, because there were, uh, there was a big group of, uh, of scientists from all kinds of disciplinaries, um, that wanted to do research in a similar area. So they built a special camp, uh, and most of the people uh, stayed in that camp throughout the whole season for six weeks. And uh, for us, this was just our, uh, our, our layover. So we went with the big uh, Hercules to uh, see them, the Central Transatlantic Mountains uh, uh, airfield. 
And from there, uh, we took our next uh, little plane, a twin altar, and we flew to our site. And it took us eight flights to get all our stuff in, because uh, a twin altar can only hold one skidoo, and we were with eight people, so we needed eight skidoos. So this is me sitting in the twin altar with a skidoo in front of me and some other stuff. And this is one of the views that you get when you're flying over the ice. And so this is where we were. I showed you this picture before. Um, the South Pole is somewhere here -ish. So we were relatively close. I think if we would have done a good job, we could have driven in less than uh, less than a day with our ski to the South Pole. Of course, we weren't about to do that. But maybe it's um, so this was the view. This is Mount Ward on the left side. It's a nearly a kilometer high mountain. And these were the Davis lunatics. And it's difficult to see and I have a better picture, but our camp was floating around here. And just to keep this in mind, this is what you can see on the in two pictures away. Um, then there's just uh, for uh, uh, some explanation, um, there's mountains and there are lunatics, and I still don't really uh, know the difference. So I looked up uh, some explanation of lunatic and some explanation of mountain, and a mountain somehow doesn't stick out of the ice if you're in Antarctica, but if it's something that's sticking out of the ice, it's called a lunatic, and everything else is called a mountain. Um, so this is our camp. And I don't know if you recall the previous picture, that was a little angle, and these are our tents. So as you can see, we were just it's just us being extremely exposed. So how do you build a camp? First of all, you build it downwind from the surface ice field, and the main reason to do that is if you surf the ice field, your morning is going upwind, and you go home downwind, so you have the wind in your back, and it's much warmer. So that's the only reason why we serve when we go downwind to make sure that if you go home at the end of the day, you're always going home in the warmer weather and not with, uh, I don't know, how cold wind in your face. And the other thing you want to do is make sure that you, your layout is perpendicular to the wind direction, because if you have the wind blowing from, uh, say, behind, then you have all the tents lined up like this. The last tent will be covered in a, a ginormous mountain of snow and will have to be dug out every day. So you make sure that you're standing like this, because then the snow will pile up just behind the tents. So that's a little bit more of a close-up of our camp. We had, in the end, actually six tents. So the four tents up front are the uh, tents for the eight team members. Every tent had two people. Then the tent that you see there, at the tent here, is the poo tent. And then we had another tent, which was the science slash party tent. We collect, we kept our meteorites there, um, uh, or actually the collecting gear, the meteorites were kept outside, the collecting gear was kept there, but we also had another stove, so for Christmas we could um, actually cook a turkey, we brought a turkey for Christmas, and we could sit all together in a nice party. But you, you don't have wine there. Hmm? You don't have wine there. Uh, actually, we did not have wine. Uh, a couple of years before us, there was a French guy who participated in the team, and he, as soon as he knew that he was going, which is about half a year before he goes, three quarters of a year, he made a whole study and he put all kinds of wines in his freezer and, and from there he picked the wine which was best drink can after being frozen. <laughs> and so he actually brought wine into the field. What we did, that's also uh, very interesting, um, if you go out in the deep field like us, per person you can bring a bottle of hard liquor per week. So technically, I could have brought six bottles of whiskey. Um, I brought two. Uh, <laughs> because six bottles of whiskey, I'm not going to finish in six weeks. Um, so everybody did have whiskey or rum or anything else that keeps you warm. So there was plenty of liquor around. Um, and this was our tent. And uh, this was actually a little bit of a joke of one of our team members who decided that we really didn't need to sleep at night. So he planted most of the flags. The flags, uh, we'll see later, are used for uh, uh, to mark uh, spots where the meteorites are collected, that they're also very good if it's windy to keep you out of the sea. But on the other hand, it was actually, I don't know, because you never hear something, it's actually kind of a nice sound to hear when you do have a flight. And yeah, I should mention that normally you would take this out of the picture, which I completely forgot, so this is what we call a pee bottle. 
Uh, during the day, you just go outside and you find a nice spot. And around the camp, we have two dedicated peace spots. Um, and you, you're anyway not allowed to um, mix different things. So all your pee has to go outside and all the poop has to go in the bucket, which is one of the great things of going to Antarctica, closing poop buckets. Um, but of course, if you're uh, if it's late at night or before you have to go to bed and you need to go to the bathroom and you don't want to put all your gear back on, you use a pee bottle and then you have to fade it. So this is uh, the size of the tent. It's about uh, nine feet wide, square, and twelve feet tall. So we actually have uh, quite a bit of room. Well, this is Rian and me. So as you can see, we both sleep on each side, and then we have the brown boxes in the middle. Uh, we have a stove here. And then our foodies, the food that we eat for about a week or a couple of days is in the tent, the rest is outside, of course. Uh, so you have bags that you can put all your uh, all your personal belongings that you want to take with you. And um, uh, with even without the stove, we always had the stove on a little bit. Uh, but when the sun was on the tent, it still was uh, actually very uh, comfortable in the tent. And so in the top of the tent, you can actually uh, hang your uh, stuff to dry out after a day. And um, here you see, uh, no, this is just a bag of stuff. No, actually, um, this was pictures just taken before Christmas. And this bag contains Todd, and Todd was our turkey. And uh, <laughs> I have the habit of naming things, so Todd our turkey was thawing in our tent. Um, so this is how you get into your tent. Um, it's always a bit tricky. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a, a fabric, it's actually two tunnels that you have your work to work your way in and out through. And uh, well, these were some random shots that, that of stuff that was hanging around in the camp. So then you go and search for meteorites. And there's two ways that we did search for meteorites. Um, we were um, unlucky enough, I would say, to be close to this mountain range. And close to a mountain range, you do have moraines. And um, what I just said, searching for meteorites on ice is great because meteorites are black and ice is white, so it totally fits if you uh, are traversing on your ski on an ice field. However, in the moraine, one in a hundred, if you're lucky, is a meteorite, and the rest is just the rest of the world. So we had one moraine that we spent three hours with eight people food searching, and we did not find any meteorite. Um, so there's other ways for meteorites. Meteorites tend to somehow collect. Uh, under rocks, so this is me hiding under a rock. And uh, this is uh, our uh, our expedition leader, uh, Jim Kerner, because uh, Ralph left halfway. He uh, was the expedition leader, and he actually found the biggest meteorite, which was about this big, and he found it by driving over it with a ski. So how do you collect a meteorite? Well, first you. Uh, you, you spot your meteorite and then uh, you halt your ski do and you start waving till the rest has seen you as well. So that sometimes takes 30 seconds and sometimes two minutes. Then you walk to the meteorite with a meteorite collection bag and the collection bag contains, uh, uh, well, you see it a little bit. So then you point at the meteorite and someone else comes and helps you collect it. So everybody else runs for it. Um, and then the first thing that happens is the meteorite is photographed. So every meteorite has a number, so the number goes on this small counter here. Um, so the meteorite is photographed on the ice with the number. And I was a dedicated photographer, so I spend a lot of time on my belly on the ice. Um, then the meteorites are collected um, using Teflon bags. Um, they used to use nylon bags. However, after a study um, actually performed by Danny Glevin, uh, someone I worked with at Goddard, uh, found that nylon gives a nice organic fingerprint, and if you're interested in organic meteorites, you do not want to take nylon. So we were upgraded to Teflon bags, and each bag is about $75. Um, of course, it blows in Antarctica, so the thing that you don't want to do is have too much Teflon bags floating around. And we, of course, lost a couple, but I don't think it works many, maybe a thousand dollars worth of technical bags are now floating on the entire um, So, and then, so you collect the meteorite in the bag, you add the tag with the, uh, with the meteorite, and then you, you cut the tape. Well, we had a whole ritual about cutting the tape. And then the GPS uh, coordinates are, um, um, uh, are recorded. 
and actually another uh, member involved with the ESMED uh, search is uh, keeping track of all the GPS data of all the collected meteorites and one of the reasons why you want a GPS uh, meteorite is if you do find something extraordinary and especially if it comes to organics uh, you also may want to go back and collect some of the ice um, uh, that the meteorite was found and um, uh, of course it doesn't tell you anything of where the meteorite comes from but still you want to make sure that, that you know where it was collected um, so and then we chipped a hole and planted the flag and then at the end of the day our search site looked like this and the reason why we planted the flags is that we at home uh, all the meteorites were searched again we had to check our little notebook with the amount of meteorites that we collected and then that all had to go into the big spreadsheet and then we had to make sure so if there was we had a meteorite extra or anything that uh, this way we could actually trace what happened to the meteorites. So this flag stayed there for a day or two. So what kind of meteorites did we find? Well, this was our first meteorite, so everybody was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, we found the majority of meteorites that we found were ordinary chondrites. As you can see, this is the tag number. We also use this to measure the size. Then we found, I think, a maximum of 20 chondrites, if at all. So this was the first meteorite that we found on New Year's Day was an achondrite. So we were very happy with that because we were all hoping that we would find something. An achondrite is getting really special if you have found 400 chondrites. Um, so and then what happens to the meteorites is they're all collected in a big box and they're ship frozen. So they go from Antarctica on the ship, still frozen, and then they're driven, they're, uh, they, are shipped all the way, I think, to Seattle, and then they go in a big uh, 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 truck uh, that transports them frozen to JSC, Johnson Space Center in Houston, and that's where they are curated, um, and so they are all uh, brought up to room temperature in a nitrogen environment just to make sure that they don't get uh, uh, too much contact with water uh, right away, and then depending on how special they are. Uh, they're, uh, well, the really special ones are being kept frozen and the other ones are being uh, quickly analyzed and then they're all shipped to the, aerospace, uh, the Natural History Museum in uh, uh, Washington DC. And then um, everybody who's interested can actually uh, write a short proposal and request uh, a part of the meteorite. And that's one of the things uh, which is nice because there's um, ESMED, which is the US campaign, then there's uh, a Japanese campaign, a Chinese campaign, an Italian campaign, as far as I know. And the big difference between the, uh, especially the Chinese and the Italian campaigns and ESMED is that ESMED's samples are uh, accessible for everybody. So it doesn't matter where you are, uh, you don't have to be working at the US Institute or any like US friendly country. In principle, everybody can request a piece of the meteorite. Uh, I think from the Japanese uh, meteorites, I, I think they are also uh, relatively open. Uh, the Chinese meteorites are just somewhere in the big vault and nobody knows anything about those. Or at least not so much. So as I said, there is uh, 20,000 meteorites in the US collection, so the Ensmet collection. There's 15,000 in the Japanese and the Chinese collections. Uh, the Chinese have a funny way of collecting anyway, they send a group of people for five months and they just search a whole strip for five months, I don't know, 20 hours a day. And so they uh, have quite a bit of uh, meteorites collected by now as well. And so 75% of all the known meteorites have been collected on Antarctica. Uh, as I said before, the meteorites are relatively pristine because they haven't been interacting with any kind of environmental uh, condition. I mean, if you find one in your backyard, uh, you never know what happened to it. Uh, and that makes it especially appealing for, uh, for uh, organic research, but also if you're interested in weathering, special weathering due to water, um, if you make sure that you thaw them under dry conditions, uh, these meteorites are, uh, are good, uh, good specimens to, uh, to analyze. Uh, so far there have been uh, 25 Martian stones uh, with our famous uh, ALH 8401 life on Mars sample, uh, 33 lunar meteorites, and uh, a large number of uh, other unusual meteorites. 
Um, so that's a little bit of sorry, and then I have a bunch of just nice pictures. And after this, I just have a really short fairy tale of something that happened to me. So this is pretty much our daily scene. So every day we we lift all the way over to the left, and then we traverse the Las here, and then we go here, and we have this view. Okay. Um, I, this is somewhere in the morning. Oh, we could you, sorry. This is, I think, about 11 a.m. Yeah, that's another thing. Of course, it's 24 hour day. And I can tell you this doesn't work. Even after six weeks, you still, I didn't get bored with this kind of views. It's so, this was from the top of Mount War, but looking at uh, our camp is over there, so we're looking to the other side. Um, pretty much everything is northish from here, obviously. No, there's a little bit south, but south is different, I think. Um, so we decided to climb one more, uh, which was, uh, climbing was great on the ski dune, then we had to go down, and uh, that was a very interesting experience. I had to have someone next to me sweet talking me the way down, because it was riding a ski dune wasn't my, uh, my favorite hobby, especially not in the slope this steep, but it does get good um, pictures. So another nice view. And then, um, on one of the last days before we left, we finally saw our penguins. Uh, we had saw one other penguin, and I have a big movie of that. Um, and these are uh, emperor penguins. Uh, they have uh, the interesting habit of losing their heads. And this is the icebreaker, which uh, is uh, opening the way for the big uh, boat. So yeah, this was uh, this was the the day before we left, and uh, we were all very excited that we got to see it. Where did they have to go? Yeah, you did. <laughs> something like that? I have no idea. Just, I have to, I guess I have to look it up. Because I, you know, you, you, your arms are still here, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so. This is what was happening. Meteorite. How do you recognize it? Yeah. 
One of the things about meteorites is they have a fusion crust because they travel through the atmosphere, so the outside gets really burnt. Um, and their their edges are relatively rounded, compared, especially compared to what you see on Antarctica. Uh, all the normal terrestrial rocks, uh, they only had, are exposed to wind erosion and not water erosion, so their edges are relatively sharp compared to what you see with meteorites. And one of the things they, they teach you in the first couple days is trying to find things that stick out. If you find a really big rock uh, amongst very tiny rocks, it might be a meteorite. Unfortunately, that really didn't happen. If you find really small rocks compared to the rest of the rocks, which happens quite more often, that might be a meteorite too. And um, at some point, the first couple of days, you still there's a lot of chert there, which is great because it's just like a chameleon. Sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it looks like that, and very very often it looks like a meteorite. So you pick up a lot of chert in the beginning. Uh, but then sometimes you, at some point, you actually do start recognizing meteorites relatively easy. And the, the main thing you look at is, is the fusion crust. Other things is um, they're uh, a magnetic. So we all carry the magnet to uh, to measure uh, whether they were magnetic or not uh, when we were in doubt. And the other thing is they have to tell you about magnetic results from The other thing uh, is they're heavier. They're much denser than terrestrial rocks. So if you're really in doubt, and we were not supposed to pick up meteorites with our hands because we didn't want to contaminate them, so we had tons to pick them up. Uh, but sometimes, of course, you think, well, you know, you've been staring at something and then you're just sick of staring at the rock for like five minutes and you're like, you're not a meteorite, and you pick it up and you're like, uh oh, that was too heavy, that must have been a meteorite. Okay, then you picked it up and it was still a meteorite, and you collect it and you make a note, pick up by meaning this case work. Okay. So that's, that's how it works. So um, you talked about how um, meteorites will land in one place and then and then be carried through the ice to a different place mm -hmm. and, and uh, next to a mountain range or whatever. Um, if you go to a, di a given site and clean it all up, clean all the meteorites out, how long do you have to wait before you can go back to that site and find some new ones? Uh, I know that in case of snowfall, for example, they have to wait about 10 years. And I think that's. I think they rotate about ten or fifty years uh -huh. between sites. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So on our side was actually we collected nine hundred and one on our side, and we were the there was a recce crew, a crew already, and then we were the second systematic group that went to the same site, and the the group before us only collected only collected six hundred meteorites because they had at least uh, 10 or maybe two weeks of 10 days because the weather was so bad. We, we had to take days off because the weather didn't get bad at all. And uh, after a week or 10 days, you just get too tired. So you just have to take a day off. We had one day that uh, it was overcast. And so the light conditions are very poor and you don't see any relief in the surface anymore. So it's too dangerous to drive snow. Mm -hmm. And that was the only day that we actually had to take off because of the weather and the no snow storms. Is there any reason you go to Antarctica? It's like a lot of logistics down there. So, well, it's are there primarily more meteorites down there than than elsewhere, or is it? Uh, well, they're so they're better preserved, okay. and they're e easier to find because they they there's no other terrestrial process that you know if you if a meteorite dumps in your backyard and it rains and you have general soil forming processes, eventually your meteorite is gone. And in Antarctica, you don't have that. It just gets buried in the ice and it just stays there. And so you have much more, uh, you have a much bigger collection of all the meteorites. Meteorites of 10,000 or 100,000 years old. I'm not really sure if you, I mean, you may be lucky, but uh, another place where they actually go is the Sahara Desert. Because it's also very dry. And that's also, uh, but that's more uh, commercial meteorite hunters. So people go there and sell them. And this is all pure for science, so it's, it's nothing commercial. Do you want to a question? Did you, find any, did you find any iron meteorites? No. Unfortunately, <laughs> because they're very blunt. Anything else? Thank <laughs> you.
And the penguin was kind enough to stay out there for two days, so I think he made at least eight trips to watch the penguin. And there's a seal on the right hand side. So. When you brought happy feet to Christ Church? He did not bring happy feet to Christ Church. <laughs> <laughs> I think happy feet was actually good for him. Okay. <laughs>